We see different types of chips every single day. Of course, you have your potato chips, you have your poker chips, but the ones that are most important are like the ones in this little bag. We're talking smaller than your fingernail, brains of all your smart devices, semiconductor chips. But if you can't see it, let me show it to you underneath a microscope. Some of these chips are smaller than the width of the human hair. Here, come take a look. We've been covering semiconductors extensively the past two years, but there are still so many more questions to answer. So this is what we're covering in our semiconductor special. You're welcome to skip around this video, but we're gonna start with the simple questions like what is a semiconductor and get as complicated as how such a tiny piece of technology can shift global politics. And with 16 different interviews from local experts to federal politicians, this is going to be thorough. Welcome to Chips 101. to someone who doesn't really know what a semiconductor is? Well, I always tell people that it's the brains behind everything they love, like your phone, your game, your TV, whatever it is you love, there's got to be something that controls operations. I've struggled for years to, to uh, explain this to my mother. The best way to describe it, layman's term, is a, it's a chip. And, and what's, what does a chip do? You know, normally it's a cell phone example. But, you know, fundamentally, uh, semiconductors are, are what what helps you know our mobile phone work or what you know is really the processor that is doing running software uh, or or on our computers or is receiving the signal off the air on a television or um, or is running an automated factory or something like that it's semiconductors that are doing the processing and actuating they're sensing they're processing and they're controlling things in an automated fashion. It is the brain behind things, but it is also the power. Everything that moves electricity around for both for information and for, you know, for, for power, for, for sensors, uh, all of it comes through semiconductors. It's an integrated circuit um, that is designed using um, unique materials that allow a, um, the flow of electrons through the chip to create a function or a, uh, um, a logical function for the device. If you look at a wire, it conducts electricity. If you look at an insulator that we all know, it doesn't conduct electricity. A semiconductor has properties where you can turn it on or turn it off, so it can act like both. And what you do is you take this silicon and you create these little structures like switches, wires, capacitors, and you put billions of them on a single device that then produces the effects that you experience on a mobile phone, on an advanced thermostat, on a voice discussion with your favorite uh, voice system. All is based on semiconductor based chips. It's a material that has uh, properties, conductivity properties that are in between a conductor and in between an insulator. The dependency on semiconductor chips and what they do for our life and our communities uh, is pervasive now. As you know, I mean, they touch so much in, the, in our lives and they make so much of the modern life possible uh, where it's, you know, the internet and computers and phones and, and our smart cars. It, it touches everything that we do. When we started here in 1996, we actually started on this uh, eight inch wafer with a very, and, and the, it was very manual. We had lots of people moving product around manually in our factory. But uh, we started the building you're in right now up on 12 inch with an automated material handling system. So everything is done with computer now uh, and, a, and a handling system which moves all the product among, uh, in the factory and brings it from tool to tool. So when you manufacture a computer chip, it's on a flat silicon wafer. Um, and we went from, gosh, a, like a, a one and a half inch to three inch um, to eight inch to 12 inch um, wafer. Um, all all focused on increasing the effectivity or the efficiency of the manufacturing process to make chips 
and higher volume, higher yield, um, lower cost. Here at uh, Samsung Austin, we offer process, processes from the 65 nanometer node all the way to the uh, 14 nanometer node. And just to, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to say, say nanometer, I'm used to feet and inches or centimeters, right? When you talk about nanometers, just to give you some perspective, there's one billion nanometers in a meter. Wow, okay. okay. Yes, and so, and just to even break it down a little bit more, the human hair is about 100,000 nanometers. So if I'm building products on a technology that's 14 nanometers, you can see it's very, very- That's you know, beyond microscopic. Beyond microscopic. <laughs> so you can't, you know, you, you, you know, you've got people who are building houses and building skyscrapers that you can actually see. Picture kind of doing that type of thing on a silicon substrate that you can't even actually see what you're doing without a microscope or a, or a tunneling electron microscope or a SEM. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. There are basically two types of chips, advanced and mainstream. Your phone, tablet, TV might only have a few advanced chips that handle the newest technology, but connected to that one advanced chip could be dozens of others providing other functions that we've just grown accustomed to. Reading the temperature or the humidity or pressure or anything, that they're driving the displays we look at, they're driving the motors that move things around. Most of the chips that go into cars are 40 nanometer and, and above. So these are you know, very old, old technologies that are still very useful. And in many, in many cases at Silicon Labs, for instance, uh, you know, we wouldn't want to put it in the most advanced technology because it would be more expensive and it wouldn't actually be better. But if you look at the state-of-the-art semiconductor device made by, for example, Samsung in Austin or Intel, you can fit roughly a thousand of these transistors side by side across the thickness of a human hair. That's how tiny they are, okay? They're much smaller than, for example, bacteria or human blood cells. I mean, they're approaching the sizes of viruses. And why is that important? That's important because if one try to make these computer chips in a room like this, you know, to our naked eyes, it looks pretty clean, right? But if you used a mi high power microscope, you'd see these dust particles floating around. And these would be like gigantic boulders that are falling on your chips when you're trying to manufacture them and nothing would function properly, okay? And the challenge when you produce that is getting everything right and eliminating um, any type of um, breakage or uh, any, any type of uh, contamination that could affect the performance of that. And to put that in perspective, um, a skin flake is devastating at that size. So as you go into an advanced semiconductor facility, it is designed so that the amount of particles in the air are so small and so few that they can't affect this. So it's essential that we have a, a continuous pipeline of new technologies. Why do you need new technologies? Because the demand for computing just keeps going up and up and up. Uh, so, you know, if we didn't get new chip technology, we'd be flatlined. We'd have only the kind of capabilities that we have uh, today and we couldn't grow to meet the demand. In semiconductor manufacturing, uh, if you go into the fabs, you're building equipment and developing processes and measuring things at the nanoscale, just, you know, we're down to uh, sort of a few nanometers, which is, just to give you a sense of for it, the, the smallest uh, atom, hydrogen, is a tenth of a nanometer. So you, if you lay 100 atoms of hydrogen across, that's about where we are today in what we do in a fab. So, but that's by no means, uh, you know, achieve without innovation. It starts with lithography. So it starts with the ability to, to print um, the, the, the lines of the circuit, the integrated circuit of a semiconductor chip, smaller and smaller and smaller, um, to add more and more devices on a, on a little small piece of real estate of silicon. Moore's Law was really, so Gordon Moore in 1965 coined the, tor the term Moore's Law, and it was really around the principle that every 18 months and it became two years, you could fit twice as many uh, transistors on a semiconductor wafer as you could two years prior. And that was really a result of, you know, refining the lithography to be able to build smaller transistors. I mean, the semiconductor industry is founded and, and based on the idea that you can put 
thousands or millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of transistors onto a single device. So everything has been shrunk into this small space, made cost effective, and yet has enabled all these things. So, you know, the first time I bought a, a, a cell phone, it was like a brick and it just did one thing, right? And you go from there to what we have today, you know, this is all enabled by semiconductor progress. The production and innovation uh, go uh, hand in hand. It's, I'll call it the, the virtuous cycle. So uh, the innovation goes on, uh, always thinking about uh, what's next. It, it looks at what's in production. It looks at uh, how it's being used and where, where does it need to be improved. That part of the virtuous cycle drives innovation. How do I solve a problem? How do I improve it? And that creates the next generation of computing devices. When we talk about generations as it relates to semiconductor chips, how long is that? So we design uh, uh, all of our chip products based on the, the market segment and what that market segment demands. PCs, well, there's a back to school every year. And so we need as a design company to have a new generation PC chip, a new CPU and, and GPU chip uh, out there in that new generation on almost, uh, you know, really an annual basis. Uh, when you think about uh, computers that go into the cloud that are that heavy lifting, uh, those are typically running on a cycle of about every uh, 18 to 24 months that they refresh and come out with a new uh, generation. And, you know, when you look at embedded devices, those devices that you don't see, but they're in the appliances around you, whether it be uh, at your home or in industrial applications, those have much longer lifetimes. Those have lifetimes of, of six, seven, or, or really, uh, you know, well over a decade in terms of their lifetime. You're cramming in billions of transistors in a piece of semiconductor, maybe an inch by an inch, okay? And all billions or tens of billions of the switches have to function properly if a single one of them fails, the whole chip fails, okay? So that's why, you know, this is a very expensive technology. And those factors become really, really expensive, where one piece of equipment can be $120 million. You know, the factory can be, as you know, 15, 20 billion. If we were to produce all those surrounding chips in a state-of-the-art brand new factory, you know, the cost would be astronomical and we wouldn't be able to afford them. So it's, it's, we've got to have factories of, of a lot of different ages from 5, 10, 15 years old to really uh, make all the different chips we need. Let's say a new advanced factory costs $20 billion to build. The building and the land might be a billion of that. The majority of the money that's going into that is the equipment that goes inside. Each of these fabs will cost around anywhere between 10 to $20 billion. And the reason they're so expensive is everything has to be super clean. The equipment that you use to make these have to be extremely precise so that you can you know, pattern these at the dimensions that I mentioned. And these are in the so-called realm of nanotechnology because the dimensions that you have are of the order of in a few nanometers. As time has gone on and things get smaller and smaller, the costs go up. It actually today is more expensive to design a logic gate or a transistor on a chip uh, the per transistor cost is starting to go up because of the difficulty to continue to follow Moore's law. I like to, I like to say that the end of Moore's law, because we are rapidly approaching the point where we will not be able to shrink further, or if we shrink further, it will cost so much that it won't make sense. It won't make economic sense. There is an energy footprint associated with this industry because some of the processing is uh, energy uh, inefficient or energy consuming, let us say. In the last 30 years, we have most definitely fallen behind um, in production uh, in the semiconductor industry. Um, and I think it's been driven by um, cost. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, many U.S. manufacturers left for lower labor costs, lower raw material costs. It doesn't matter what, pick an industry. <clears throat> Semiconductors was no exception. When you're operating, you're always looking at your people your energy and your water. Um, you know, over the past couple years, certainly we had some issues with the energy, uh, you know, after winter storm Uri, but I, I feel pretty confident those are resolved. Um, but, you know, people and, and talent is um, a challenge. We had the winter storm, <clears throat> and now the war in Ukraine can have some effect on raw material supplies, where chemical, chemicals go and what's available and that sort of thing. So. 
there seems to always be something here of late that is challenging the industry, but I think that they're, they're still a very optimistic industry with the, you know, the expansions that they've announced here in Texas. Those jobs have now changed. Everything's robotic controlled, automation, and so all the jobs now require some degree of knowledge. Unless we do the leading edge research and produce the PhDs who work at these companies, you know, the, the, you know, so, the sort of, you know, you kill the seed corn, you kill the innovation pipeline, if you will, right? And then manufacturing will stop, not immediately maybe, but, you know, maybe five, ten years down the line. To have a, a, a thriving ecosystem, you've got to have, uh, you know, companies that are doing design, you've got to have the workforce, you've got to have the water, the power resources, you've got to have the, the material supply. You have to have, um, you know, an ecosystem of the complete ecosystem. You've got to have um, the roads and you've got to have the housing uh, and, and all those things that um, the, the, the technology and these great companies are going to bring people in. Uh, but we also have to care for the people who are going to live here. Semiconductor fabs use a lot of water, so you need to make sure that that base is covered. Uh, the, the fabs also need a very highly skilled workforce, different levels. And it's not all engineers. There's so many levels that people can get into. So if you're the guy who just doesn't want to go to college, no problem. We can get you in that industry in, in eight weeks with a short pr a program that gives you some fundamentals. You know, so it just, it opens opportunities at all levels and they're all great career tracks, and that's what I, I don't think everyone realizes. The workforce talent pipeline for just about any industry sector you're talking about today is rather frightening. We, we've got millions of jobs in the United States that are going unfilled due to lack of a skilled pipeline. The people are there, the skills don't necessarily match up with the individual's ability to fill certain jobs. I think there's always a challenge because when things change in the semiconductor industry, whether it's the equipment or materials or processes, you have to relearn it because you can't just grow in, an, in one area. Like the machines are going to be completely different and they have different problems, right? So there's always a challenge of learning the new things. There's over 67,000 people working in uh, advanced manufacturing in Central Texas. Um, but uh, as some of that pipeline ages and as there's expansion in the region in manufacturing, you're keeping an eye on talent. We want to make sure we have the right technicians, uh, the right frontline workforce that are getting excited about, you know, building these chips and coming in. I think there's really just this need for us to do a continued uh, education, reevaluation of our skills and just upskilling and reskilling and kind of a continuous basis in the workforce. They've supported us in getting started with our uh, high school manufacturing academy. That's another huge push because again, these are the young people, the generation of tomorrow. If we get their interest in and they will trickle down to their siblings, their friends, then more people will start to see it's not the way you think it is. It's actually really a cool place to work or there's a lot of opportunities. Um, I'm hoping that that will, but that's still, st it's slow, but we're trying to get into that middle, the high school, and then you can't just wait till they're in high school nowadays because they decide at freshman year or eighth grade year what they want to do. We have to impact middle school. The growth is, is slow by some standards. You know, it may take two or three years to realize the full ripple effect, um, but you'll start seeing it almost immediately. The uh, semiconductor industry sector has a jobs multiple of seven, <clears throat> which means we roughly have 250,000 Americans working directly in the semiconductor industry, uh, but they also spin off 1.8 million more jobs. So that is 250,000 direct jobs times seven, you get the 1.8 million. That is critical. Uh, to all of our sectors, but <clears throat> you know, this is one sector that produces a, a, an exponentially large amount of indirect jobs. Close to 40% of the equipment that's utilized in the world um, to manufacture a computer chip is manufactured in, in Austin, Texas. Um, all driven by the engineers, um, the technologists, the technicians, the welders um, that are being educated and grown out of this local area. So there's, you know, four to five times you know, 
ancillary jobs that are supporting us that are out there. There's a huge ecosystem of suppliers, um, you know, that are also contributing to our economy, that are supporting them. Um, but we're unique in the United States in that we have a, um, you know, very multi-layered semiconductor sector. You have companies that are making the chips, uh, like Samsung and NXP and Infineon, um, and you have companies that are making the equipment, like Applied Materials and Tokyo Electron. Um, and then you also have these fabulous, you know, um, internet, uh, semiconductor companies that are designing these really high-end chips like AMD and Silicon Labs. So um, from a complexity and diversity standpoint, I think we have one of the most robust ecosystems in the United States. Our customers cannot make microchips without Tokyo Electron. We're going to grow into this, but we've got to be deliberate in that growth. We can't hope for the best. We, we've really got to do some planning and we've all got to kind of get on the same page. That ripple effect for the economy uh, becomes part of the economy at some point. We have lithography equipment, coder developers, we have uh, furnaces or thin film capabilities, etchers, probers. Uh, there's six distinct different pieces of equipment or business units that are part of this ecosystem that really provides technology that enables life. I think we have such an incredible workforce in the United States. I mean, people are very innovative and they work very hard. And I think that's driving more and more of that work back. It's not just based on how, how, how inexpensive you can hire a operator today with all the automation. It's, it's how innovative can our engineers be to develop the next generation product. These companies are, are employing over 20,000 people. The average wage in semiconductor is $170,000 a year. Um, they're generating over $4.5 billion in direct economic impact. And if you look at really the um, extended impact where, you know, janitorial companies and suppliers are, are working with them, it's more about uh, a $20 billion impact. So it's, it's one of our leading contributors to our economic success. And, um, you know, one of the reasons we're a technology town. Texas Comptroller Public Accounts tracks the economic impact of the semiconductor industry. And it's nothing to sneeze at, which would ruin an entire wafer of chips anyway. According to the Comptroller's office, in 2020, the industry contributed $15.3 billion in gross domestic product just in Texas. That's amounted to about 15% of the country's GDP attributable to the semiconductors that same year. Of all the products Texas exports, chips made up 27.4%. And in terms of jobs, more than 41,000 Texans work in this industry. Nearly 14,000 of those jobs are just in Travis and Williamson counties. There's a wide variety of capabilities within this industry, and it's encouraging as we think about the growth in the industry, uh, the number of jobs and expertise and, and the criticality of STEM education that comes to this ecosystem is an important need for us right now as we rapidly expand. If we don't have semiconductors and the right particular you know, level uh, of sophistication of those uh, microchips, then you, know, you don't have these other industries. There's all these models out there. Probably the average of them is that for every dollar we spend, it'll move seven times through the economy. The macro picture is growth, and it's, it's, it's going to grow. The growth trend is going to continue. The world's going to get smarter. It's going to get more connected. Um, there's going to be ups and downs. There's cycles. Forecasting is hugely important when it comes to the supply chain. Historically, what happens in this market, and this is kind of in the cycles, we overshoot the market. And all of a sudden, then we, we have a period of time where we have too much production. Um, too much equipment that's been, too many people hired, and we go into a, into a downturn or a downswing in the market. And my biggest concern is that's exactly what will happen. I mean, I, I think that, um, I think there's a, right now there's a lot of overreaction um, for us not having the capacity today to support the need from three months ago or six months ago. Um, but I, I do believe it'll catch up very quickly. Um, and when it does catch up, I think we'll overshoot. The thing about the supply chain is all it takes is one missing link, one component that you can't get, and then you, you can't complete the, the, the product. You can't get it into your consumer's hands. We can really only see and predict three quarters ahead of time, roughly, um, but it's gonna continue. And then much like an energy correction, it's gonna correct. We're gonna be oversupplied, whether it's a global recession that just, you know, related to inflation, 
you know, the interest rates that we're reading about just to control the growth and control inflation, eventually you, can, you, you never nail that, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the world economics is something beyond any government's control. So we're going to be in a position where there's oversupply to the demand in that one point in time, and that will correct in a cycle of 12 to 30 months. And then, but the overall trend of semiconductors in every aspect of life is going to continue for the foreseeable future. The semiconductor industry, I believe, more than any other industry, has really created more of a global economy um, versus a, um, a regional or a, a, a nationalistic economy. Six out of the top 10 design houses who are chip designers in the world, six out of the ten, top 10, are in the United States. Certainly the U.S leads in semiconductor design. Over half of the, the semiconductors sold globally are sold by U.S. companies. Uh, but with the manufacturing offshore, much of it in Taiwan. Because it was more cost effective to offshore a lot of this, we didn't think a whole lot about it. The companies were profitable. We still had the um, uh, cachet of being the developers of this. But all the while, these countries took what we had um, innovated built on it, built the infrastructure to really outpace us, both from a, an educational research and development to um, really building the infrastructure to continue um, at scale for the pace of, of, of the semiconductor industry. If we didn't pass the bill, uh, the CEOs of these companies told me they'd have to go elsewhere. They would go to Europe, they'd go to Asia. Well, in June of 2020, I introduced the Chips for America Act with Mark Warner, who's the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, a uh, Democrat from Virginia. The House has passed it. After waiting more than 18 months, the funding for the Chips Act passed Congress in July as the Chips and Science Act, providing $39 billion for semiconductor production incentives, $13.2 billion for semiconductor research and development incentives, and $500 million for supply chain and communications improvements. All these incentives rely on agreements struck between companies and local governments, like school districts, cities, or counties, to show a company's commitment to the area. The local incentives are, are so important to helping these businesses be competitive in the United States. Most of the countries that have a big semiconductor industry in the world have their own incentives already. So starting with China, Taiwan, Korea, uh, all over Europe, there are already incentives. So we're, um, in a way, we're just trying to level the playing field with the CHIPS Act. This is something we're not accustomed to doing, which is making these huge federal investments in, uh, in, in incentives to provide, uh, have businesses come back on shore. Um, we, over the over years, we had this, uh, this idea that if it was, could be made cheaper someplace else, then that was a good thing. And it is good for consumers by and large, but when it's something that's absolutely essential uh, to our economy and the technology advances that we're, we continue to see and our national security, that's where uh, it became a game changer. It's hitting the radars of our our federal government right now in terms of national security. If we don't and you know ensure that we have our own independence to create these chips, control the products that they go into, uh, we're really at risk. We're at risk of falling behind as a technological leader, but there's a true risk as far as the threats of our, our foes and what they could do and, and how they could potentially cause harm. It was uh, in 1990, over a third of the semiconductors globally were made in the U.S. As, as you fast forward in time, today you've got about 12, 13 percent of the global semiconductors made in the U.S. And there was a growing realization that from both an economic security standpoint as well as a national security standpoint, it's important to have semiconductor manufacturing done uh, within the U.S. to a certain extent and to, and to kind of reverse that trend. So the, uh, really the, the motivation for the CHIPS Act was to provide subsidies to companies to build manufacturing facilities here and also to do uh, advanced research uh, and development uh, around semiconductor manufacturing and to bring that, uh, some portion of that back to the U.S. And, and, it, and you, if you look globally, a lot of the, co the countries out there, whether it's China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, provide significant incentives uh, to build factories in those locations. So it's really a, a bit like you're leveling the playing field 
uh, in terms of making it uh, cost competitive to build those facilities in the U.S., whereas before uh, we would be at maybe a 30, 40 percent disadvantage in terms of cost if you built the factory here, which is why the, the factories were built, being built in other locations. And when you look at the long-term ramifications from a national security standpoint, to produce these national security assets here in the United States and not in countries that are vulnerable to communist China uh, protects that valuable asset. I think that there is a growing awareness within the industry and within the customers of the semiconductor industry that geographical diversity, you know, whether the factory's in the U.S. or it's in Germany or it's in Israel or it's in Singapore or it's in Korea, as long as you've got that diversity, that provides some redundancy and, and better security in terms of any one choke point that might come under pressure as a result of, of conflict. China is the number one threat to uh, us economically and, and potentially even militarily. Uh, while we've been focused on the Middle East, um, they've been rising, uh, thanks in large part to a lot of American businesses that have invested in China. Uh, and we know that uh, despite our hopes that they would become part of the rules-based uh, international order, they don't play by the rules. Uh, they steal everything they can get their hands on uh, from an intellectual property standpoint, and they simply don't play by the rules. So uh, this is a huge challenge for us. Um, they are rising militarily, uh, stockpiling their nuclear arsenal, becoming more and more of a potential threat um, allied with uh, Russia. And uh, so this is a geopolitical uh, challenge for us and one that uh, we need to take seriously. I'm of the opinion that we don't have to do everything here. We have to have a certain portion of it here, but you also need geographic diversity. And having that concentration in Taiwan is, is dangerous because, you know, as we saw over the last week, you know, and Nancy Pelosi goes to, you know, to visit Taiwan and all of a sudden you've got missiles flying and, you know, navies walking around and lots of rhetoric. And, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity, uh, you know, geopolitics and, and um, um, you know, the one China policy and a lot of sensitivity to Taiwan. And so having that concentration in such a hot spot globally is something that we all have to really be concerned about. Why, why do we have to be concerned about that? Well, if, for instance, all of that fab capacity, 50 percent of the global fab capacity in Taiwan, if there were, was a real conflict that broke out, and let's say something happened to one of those fabs or there was an embargo, um, you couldn't make those chips. And inside of a, a mobile phone, for instance, you might have 20, 30 different chips inside that phone. And if one of them comes from a factory in Taiwan and you lose access to that, you can't make that product. And so it's really, if you lost, truly lost the, the capacity that's in Taiwan today, uh, you almost couldn't build anything. As far as uh, a country like China that's sp raced ahead of us as far as production and their ability to do it, how that, how that controls so much of what we need to do to protect our resources, our people, our freedoms, uh, protect our allies, protect our economy. Um, you know, we tend to swing the big stick in the world and you see that power diminished and that's a, uh, a scary prospect for a country like the U.S. Um, we've let it slip because we were the innovators of this product. I don't think anyone knew how impactful it was going to be, how the technology was going to evolve to the extent that it is today. If you think during the Cold War uh, that nuclear missiles were the mutually assured destruction, and in, you know, whether we want to call you know, the economic or the competition with China a new Cold War, but in that competition, uh, the mutually assured destruction is a few semiconductor factories in Taiwan. And it would, it would dramatically you know, impact us that you know, we couldn't build a lot of the products. You know, a lot of those end products, for instance, iPhones are built in China, and you would think that you know, if hostility breaks out, that's so where the end products are designed, you wouldn't have access to the semiconductors. Uh, but also, so that would have a huge impact on us. I think it would drive the, the world into a global depression if that, if that truly came to pass. I mean, the technology companies could, could all move out. Um, and put China in a very bad place. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. It's, it's not going to be driven by nations. It's not going to be driven by politicians. It's going to be driven by co companies. And it's going to be driven by the semiconductor companies, I believe. So in the geopolitical realm of how things are done and the, and the power around the world, I think that you're going to look at the Samsungs and the, the Microns and the Intels and the TSMCs. They're going to really have a lot, of, a lot of pull in what happens. If you look at Chinese history, 
and, and when revolutions happen and when you know, a change of a dynasty happens, it's because people are out of work. And you know, China's success has been you know, creating jobs and moving people into the middle class and, and out of poverty. And there are so many jobs in China that depend on those semiconductors from Taiwan and, and all of those, you know, both for their domestic economy as well as their export economy. So I think that there, the Taiwan is super important to both sides here. And, and I think that you know, the, the, the hope is that, is that rational minds prevail and understand how important that is to, to China's economy and Chinese, the China's society as well as the U.S. economy uh, from an economic security, you know, we would, we would see, you know, mass unemployment, there would be mass unemployment in China. If and when one of those world events happens and suddenly we have cut off supply that has major ramifications. And I believe that's the scale we need to look at. Um, and we're just starting to see steps to make that happen. And it sounds like a lot of it um, is going to happen in Texas. We have a, a national semiconductor technology center in the bill. Uh, that would be great to have, you know, a partnership like what we have with the UT system and A&M on Army Futures. We could do something like that. In the um, semiconductor um, ecosystem, um, many important parts of uh, our economy, for example, uh, cloud AI represented by companies like Microsoft and Google, um, you know, consumer electronics represented by Apple and, and companies like that, and then even electric cars represented by companies like Tesla, which have a lot of compute on that. So a car is no longer just, just a vehicle, it is also a, a computing device in many ways because it has a lot of sensors. And so all of these important industries, automotive, uh, cloud AI, um, consumer electronics, uh, and even areas like industrial electronics um, and uh, uh, healthcare applications like wearables, uh, and then aerospace. These are all areas where semiconductor fabrication is a very important driver for all of these things. And so this is not just a supply chain issue, it's also staying at the leading edge. Because uh, you know, uh, if you fall behind in the way these chips are made, then the entire ecosystem suffers. The relationships are not what they used to be in certain countries. And we're already seeing the supply chain, uh, particularly some of the U.S. companies, uh, move their supply chains to Vietnam, to other countries, uh, maybe still in Asia. And then, then many of those uh, tier one and tier two suppliers may be coming back to North America, preferably the U.S. and more preferably, obviously, Texas. What I think is really interesting, Mike, about Central Texas is that we're adding the technologies of the future. You know, we have this really interesting things happening around energy, um, electric vehicles, you know, communication, and semiconductors are empowering that. Uh, but they're not only empowering it, they're being made here as well. So, you know, when I think about the future technology, uh, I think Central Texas is really well poised for several decades of growth and being a significant contributor to a global economy in a way that most regions can't be. Um, Texas is the, the home, I mean, the, the, the first integrated semiconductor chips were created in Texas, um, which is something that we should be very proud of. Um, Austin, Texas, which has often been known as Silicon Hills, um, has driven a lot of the innovation. When I uh, was here in the mid 90s, one thing I uh, always liked even from that time was uh, the Silicon Hills poster, you know, that I had. and, and uh, Silicon Hills, uh, you know, with this Austin was known as this technology hub, second maybe only to Silicon Valley. Uh, and on this poster, you could see all the high tech companies. So even from, you know, the, the 80s with Dell's, ex, you know, expansion here and so many more technology companies coming here. And as you said, many semiconductor companies, maybe the names have changed, right? But there's still many in, in production now. The climate uh, from a business perspective, I think uh, the playbook that Central Texas and, and the state have developed, when you look what they've attracted over the last 10 years, uh, those incentives have worked quite well. What you'll find and when you look at the semiconductor industry is it's a partner and compete model that all of us have in the industry. Of course we compete. We compete on the design of our products. And 
and the markets that we go after and tailor those, those products to. Uh, but we partner on uh, helping make sure that common problems can be addressed. And so that is that the universities uh, can provide us the kind of skill pool that we need. Uh, that's to make sure that, it, that uh, we have the right uh, standard so that any one of our chips can work interoperably with one of the other person's chips. Just take the Austin area as an example. It's a vibrant, uh, rich uh, community that attracts some of the best talent because of the quality of life and uh, what uh, this area in Central Texas offers people is attracting them. So it makes for good business. And then that whole uh, community of university, of, um, of high tech, as well as the various different uh, groups of um, industries and uh, people together in, in the Central Texas makes for a very innovative environment, very vibrant environment for us to do what we do. If you tried to go out and build a semiconductor factory just out you know, in another state that had, and you were the first one there, you're breaking so much new ground when it comes to the talent network and, and the infrastructure to get things, you know, into your factory that you need is just so many specialized chemicals and gases and materials that you know that that it's a big hill to climb whereas if you're starting off or or adding in a in a state like texas the infrastructure is already here in the late 80s japan was eating our lunch in terms of semiconductor manufacturing and the market share of u.s companies worldwide was shrinking okay when semitic came into existence they help reverse the trend. Back in the 90s, there was an organization called Semitech um, that, that operated out of Central Texas, and it really was a consortium of new technologies to support um, the industry all over the world. Um, and it was, it was something that was, we were very proud of. If you look at the, the, the you know, Motorola back in the day had multiple computer or factories here in Central Texas, um, Cypress Semiconductor. Um, there's a lot of, lot of organizations, AMD, that either started here um, developed their processes and their products here um, and kind of grew out of this area. Texas really started the whole revolution, okay? I mentioned that I started my life at Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. The first integrated circuit was invented by Jack Kilby, who in fact won the Nobel Prize in Physics for invention of the IC. So that happened in Dallas, Texas, okay? Texas Instruments was also the company that made the first silicon transistor. The semiconductor industry took a little dive back in 2000 eight before then, and so we started expanding the scope of what we teach. Um, and s now fast forward, technology has impacted everybody, and it's not just about them, it's about manufacturing in general. So now we're back here growing in a broader sense, which is good because there's always someone moving forward, right? So it gives students a, a bigger um, foundation for them to keep growing in their field and being able to maybe possibly relocate to another company if needed. If somebody gets laid off, hopefully they're uh, marketable to another company that's in the area. And now with all the companies moving here, you can't lose to have some experience or some education in manufacturing. It makes it much easier to find employment, which is important for people. To I know that there's several major organizations, major companies um, looking at the Central Texas area to, to plant and grow their next or their latest and greatest future manufacturing facility to support the manufacturing of semiconductor chips. Um, if you look at the, the memory industry, I mean memory being the, the, the semiconductor um, product that actually stores data um, for our cell phones, for our computers, for our cameras, for everything that we live you know, and use today, um, a lot of that is being done here in Central Texas and I think a lot more of that will be done in Central Texas in the future. And that drives everything today, I believe. Advanced semiconductors now are using a new photolithography technique and require tools called uh, EUV, or extreme ultraviolet. Uh, and those tools, uh, the price of those are pretty much doubled uh, what currently, say, we're even in this factory. Uh, so the, the technology, you know, if we look at what's been going on in semiconductors lately, when we talk about advanced technology, you know, a lot of it is around uh, the tools change, and the materials change typically whenever we start getting uh, newer advanced technologies. So when people are trying to do seven nanometers or less uh, right today, they require that new EUV tool. And so it's very expensive. So if you look at the capabilities in the landscape 
for advanced semiconductors. Right now, there's only three companies uh, that have the technology and the capital investment to be able to do EUV and advanced technology right now. And that's uh, Samsung, of course, Intel, and TSMC. We happen to have one of the best semiconductor clusters you know, in the world right here in Central Texas. And um, that's enabling growth in so many different ways. There was a period in the semiconductor industry that was very focused on PCs. There was another phase that was very focused on cell phones. Now we're going into a phase of the industry which I call the age of edge computing. And that is the idea that there are many, many, many devices using electronics computers to do useful things. Um, they're being deployed in factory, they're being deployed to make healthier livestock, um, healthier milk, healthier uh, farming output. Um, they're being deployed to uh, extend uh, quality of life in your home through different types of devices. Uh, and it's going to continue to be adopted uh, in um, uh, more different forms that you're going to desire to have and is going to be beneficial for you to have in your life. So I see a phase of the industry where um, more electronics, more capability, which is uh, software, hardware, and then the ease of use of those devices is going to become more and more prevalent. But you think about all this demand, 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 well, people keep consuming, where does all that go? Because this is actual hardware. Even if it's getting smaller, where does it all go uh, at the end of the day? And you know, the e-waste, the e-recycling, um, the environmental impact of all this material is, is a huge question. I don't have the right answer uh, for it right now, um, but you know, as we potentially build ramp up, ramp up, oversupply, even when it's not oversupply, but when your phone becomes obsolete, doesn't work, and it's already been changed hands three or four times and it's finally just dead, and how many hundreds of millions of phones and computers and devices are like that? What, what does the industry agree upon and what are the, you know, the governments agree on is, is how, how do we manage that? And that's something that's probably not a priority in the current situation, um, but, but should come up and, and should be discussed. Um, and we wanna be on the forefront of that. I believe in the near future, there's gonna be requirements on companies that are um, procuring chips for their assemblies and their devices and a responsibility to what happens at that product at the end of that life. Um, and like we do in the supply chain, we will probably help facilitate that, uh, that process in some way. There's uh, often more focus on how do we use technology longer in a lifetime. So how can I use a generation minus one or generation mi minus two? So it's one or two generations old in other applications. And so we start thinking about in, uh, in designing computers, how for instance memories, uh, could you could use the current memory or even an older memory generation in that same computer. So uh, effectively improving the life of those semiconductor chips. That was a lot. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching Chips 101. However, there's always more to learn. Each of these 16 interviews in their entirety, along with this entire special, are available on our website, app, KV Plus, and YouTube channel. And thank you to all the people I interviewed for contributing to this special. My videographers, Andrew Sanchez, Eric Malowitz, Aaron Johnson, Hickey Mustanen, Scott Guest, Bob Buckaloo for making the graphics, and my executive producer, Laura Sather, for her guidance and oversight through the past four months of this project.